So with me on stage today, we have back on stage after the first session, Sebastian Adu, uh, Canal Plus uh, Digital Editor-in-Chief. And we have uh, Johannes Franken, HBS Director of Digital, and Matt Stagg, BT Sport Mobile and Immersive Strategy Director. So Web 3.0, or third generation internet, is the next evolution of the World Wide Web. It's gonna be a highly decentralized, it's highly decentralized and driven by machine learning, edge computing, artificial intelligence, and it uses blockchain technology um, to protect users in this whole peer-to-peer -peer web. Um, the metaverse is going to be, so the metaverse is something that comes up a lot, um, it's gonna be some, an important part of the way this works in the future. But at the moment, um, we're already talking about and working on metaverse projects, a lot of those are what we just saw in that video from BT Sport. So let's unpick what on earth all this stuff is and <laughs> why we should be so excited about it and interested. So I want to start with Johannes, first of all. Um, can you, in layman's terms, because I know you like this subject a lot, <laughs> um, can you tell us about what exactly three, Web 3.0 is, how it relates to blockchain, cryptocurrency, NFTs, um, and how it all fits together? Sure. Um, hey, everyone. <laughs> so, uh, as you know, I'm very excited about the topic. And when the public ledger from which in Bitcoin wasn't able to handle smart contracts, developed to Ethereum and enabled smart contracts with that, you can then have technologies like NFTs. That was really the breakthrough for the foundation of Web 3.0. To most of you, I know this was complete rubbish and irrelevant. So let me take a step back. Um, the blockchain is, in a very simple term, and this is how I visualize it in my brain, uh, it's a lot of standardized paper that is distributed amongst a lot of people. And on that piece of paper, ownership of everything that exists is noted. And only when 51% of the people that have such a paper in hand agree to a transaction, then a transaction is valid, and everybody can look at their paper of who is owning what. So, if you own a Bitcoin that is written down on all of those papers, then you want to give that to me. The moment that 51% of every person that has that paper agrees to that, then your Bitcoin is mine. And that's basically the blockchain in a nutshell. It gets a bit more complex when you're coming to smart contracts. Then you have things that are a bit more sophisticated than just ownership statements, and you get into other forms of blockchains that are more sophisticated, like the Ethereum one, as an example. With that, then you can declare ownership of images. And basically, images, other media content, or images is the first thing that started, but if you take everything digital and the ownership of that, and that's NFTs in a nutshell. So very simplified, but I think it's when we have that conversation, it makes sense to go back to a breakdown that we say, okay, we roughly have an idea of what we're talking about. And how does that relate to Web 3.0, which must be awesome because it's one more than Web 2.0. <laughs> um, I think from a customer perspective, the initial Web 3 experiences will be very similar to what we know today from the internet. Um, so for a user, it will be similar. You have a URL that maybe doesn't start with HTTP because there are other protocols involved, but on the background, you have this declaration of ownership, which you mentioned in your introduction is really what is having this explanation, which is making it more safe or at least more publicly knowledgeable. With having that distributed and not concentrated to a single, today, if Mark Zuckerberg decides that I'm not on Facebook, I'm not on Facebook anymore, which sucks. So therefore, I like the idea of Web 3.0 because then it's not a single entity, but it takes 51% of all the participating players to decide that I'm not on Facebook anymore. And this is, I think, it's one aspect of Web 3.0, which I believe is a very exciting one. Mm. I agree, I agree. And then on, the, I mean, this is something of a game of two halves here. So we've got Web 3.0 on one side, the metaverse is in development on the other side. Um, with, with the metaverse, you know, as, well, I've got two broadcasters on stage here, BT Sport, Canal Plus. So what does this mean to you? So start with you, Sebastian. Um, well, to me, it's probably 
in my opinion, the single biggest disruption that we've seen in live sports since the beginning of live sports. Because if you look at it, um, um, I mean, uh, technology has evolved. We went from black and white to color television, from 4x3, 16x9, to SD, to HD, to 4K, 8K, 12K, whatever. Um, but uh, the, the, the storytelling around live sports has, has pretty much remained the same. We added a lot of layers. We, we talked about it uh, uh, this morning. Here we're talking about something that will be 100% completely different, which is, I guess, very frightening to every uh, one uh, in the business of, of live sports everywhere. But at the same time, terribly exciting as well. Uh, because I think it will allow a lot of new tech to emerge, stuff that we haven't seen really emerge since, uh, um, since those technologies have existed, like uh, we've seen in, in this great video, AR, VR, you know, volumetric pixels and so on, uh, which I think will be uh, able to provide new experiences within the metaverse. Um, but, uh, but, I mean, yeah, it, it will definitely be a totally new world where broadcasters will, alt will have to think completely differently about doing what we've been doing forever. Mm. Matt? I thought I was up here to talk about the Watch Together platform that I developed <laughs> and, um, and launched last year. But anyway. One person yeah. uses. Um, for me, uh, I think um, uh, all very exciting and it's good to have some, um, some other people who are, uh, who are interested as well. Um, I see it uh, taking a step back um, and, and really analyze what this can mean for sport. And uh, the way I see it is if you take a sports fan um, any sports fan wants to be at the event in the stadium. You, you do not get a better way to watch sport than that, but than play it, maybe. Um, after that, there's, there's quite a big gap to what you do next. It's in front of the biggest screen you can get with your friends. And then after that, if you're on your own, you do watch together. <laughs> I am joking. And they, um, so for me, metaverse and immersive go hand in hand, and that's how we bridge that gap between the large screen and the stadium. How do we take people to the stadium? How do we t bring people together? And, it, and in terms of, of that, you know, I have a number of reservations around it because I've got kids and I, I have a lot of concern about spending, we all know about spending time on our own, but it's going to change, you know, and that's where as a broadcaster, we have to understand what our fans and, and our subscribers are doing. Now, if in, in five years' time, uh, people are interacting when they can't be together in virtual worlds and virtual environments, then that's how we will bring our social viewing experience, because that's what it is. Sport is, is social. You, you don't just want to, even if it's just texting your mates while you're watching it. So um, I see it has a, a huge opportunity to, um, to bring on the, the immersive sort of uh, things. You know, that was a, a vision that I wrote three years ago now. And that's why we wanted to bring it on here to say. Um, but I still think in terms that stands, you know, it takes people together and gives people additional ways of viewing sport. Yeah, absolutely. And Johannes, it, is the metaverse one of those buzzwords? I mean, at our football summit in, in March this year, every single session, somebody mentioned metaverse. So we thought, oh, we better talk about this. Um, so is it one of those buzzword, buzzwords that people are kind of jumping on right now and saying, hey, metaverse me, you know, as a, <laughs> do you hear this a lot? <laughs> Sometimes you have customers approaching us with exactly that statement. I mean, it's a bit exaggerated, but from a concept. Um, for me, the metaverse in, in itself, uh, when I'm thinking about a metaverse, um, and to, to come back to that definition, I'm being a bit a stickler for definitions, um, I think it's a universe that is existing in the absence of the active viewer. Meaning that when you play a normal computer game, when I press save and end, the computer game stops, and when I reload it, I'm back in it. The metaverse is changing in that time. So taking that example from the gaming world, when you look at things like World of Warcraft, which is 15 years old by now, in theory, 
that is a metaverse. Now, I can't take my NFT of a bored monkey that I bought for thousands of euros. I can't take that to World of Warcraft and pin it on my wall because those worlds are not talking to each other. And I think it's very important when we think about the metaverse today, well, there is a company that claimed the name for themselves, but there is not the metaverse. There are a lot of platforms existing where you have people gathering for that social experience, including watch parties and, and other things that people or humans like to do, um, but there is not that platform. And so when people come to me uh, with that meta was me, um, oh yeah, you know in the 90s I, wanted to, I went to school, I wanted to have a motorbike, and at that time I had people coming to me, private people said, I need to have a website. Back then, I wanted to have a motorbike. I didn't ask any question. I built a lot of websites for private people where I never asked, saw, saw the point. When somebody today is coming saying, Meta was me, the more professional answer is, hey, why? And then you come to the point that somebody at one of those conferences heard Meta was is the big thing, so I need to be there. Most often, the second answer on that is, I need to have a younger audience. And I think then it starts making sense. When you say, as a broadcaster, I have a bit of a target group issue, um, then you want to reach a new audience for that. One of the intuitive things is that you start going to new platforms. And Metaverse, for me, is a new platform. Or what we heard the other people speaking about social media a couple of years back, that was the new platform that people wanted to go to find a new audience. And Metaverse, for me, is one of those new platforms providing a lot of new abilities, like you mentioned, things that haven't been there before. But for me, it's, it's that new outlet enabling people to use it. Definitely. And, and to all of you, um, you know, how might this, the metaverse shake up sports broadcasting, as you mentioned, Sebastian, you know, from, from storytelling and production, you know, the way sports broadcasting works, to new market competitors in the future who broadcasters will actually be up against, you know? Well, uh, as Matt mentioned, I think uh, the, the great thing is that it, it, it has the potential to bridge, you know, the in-stadium experience with the at-home experience. You're going to be able to bring content to the people in stadium, as the video shown, uh, with AR in particular. And then with VR, you can basically leave your couch and be in the stadium, maybe in Jack Nicholson sit at the crypto center watching a Lakers game. Or maybe even better than that, because, I mean, we will see probably ways of capturing the footage of the, of, the, of the actual games with new tools which maybe will allow us to be on the actual court and watching the game from there. I mean, that's totally possible. Um, so uh, it brings up uh, an awful lot of new uh, possibilities, but with that, you're right, uh, a lot of new competition as well uh, from the, the tech industry for sure, for the gaming industry, which will by the next five years, probably be the same company than the tech industry at the scale of which we're seeing acquisition these days. Uh, but yeah, I mean, definitely it will uh, definitely accelerate the, the process of uh, tech companies taking a big, a big chunk of this new environment. Um, yeah, I think there's a few, a, a few interesting things. And, and often we get thrown all Web3 metaverse and NFTs and blockchain and cryptocurrency, all in the same thing. But actually, they're very separate. Some are enablers for doing some uh, the, the overlays on top. You know, metaverse, as we, we've talked about, is, is not one thing, and it will take a long time before it is. Then you've got immersive, and NFTs are, you know, digital art almost. People digital bragging rights, you know, it is. Um, I, I mean, I think they're, they're great. I just wish I was the one that um, made an NFT out of a blank piece of white and sold it for 30,000 pounds. <laughs> but, you know, it's the same, same with art, but there, there's some really interesting stuff there. So, um, you know, and I, I mentioned before, uh, it, we can make certain aspects of not being able to be at a stadium. We can actually, then some of the information that we get that people don't have at the stadium, 
we can add that into an immersive stadium experience out. You know, you should be able to turn around and, and talk to your mate who, who got the ticket. But, you know, we're all quite privileged here because we're in the sport industry, so we go to games. You know, there are some people who in, in the UK will never be able to go to a Premier League match. So it's not about, oh, I just couldn't get a ticket. It's accessibility. You know, they're really expensive. Um, so, you know, can we take those people to the stadium? But actually, if I'm a season ticket holder, I've only ever sat in one seat. I've only ever sat in the cheap seat, <laughs> obstructed view. Um, so I can, someone could take me into a stadium. Well, then you've got the whole opportunity. Um, you sit wherever you like. You could actually stand in the middle of the, as, as you mentioned, you stand in the middle of the pitch and watch it all go on around you as a, um, you know, a, a, in a virtual environment. So I think there is, at the moment, quite a lot, and, 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 we, and we've seen it um, trialled with. I don't think we're going anywhere with, you know, um, you meet up, we meet up in a, in a virtual world as an avatar and sit down in a virtual lounge and watch a TV because you're getting nothing out of that. You may as well just like phone them up and put the phone down on the, um, on the table. So it's how do we use this to create more, not just to go closer to the stadium, but how in certain aspects, obviously not the, the, um, the atmosphere, but how do we make it better from a visual point of view um, and give them something extra? Mm. And what are the technologies that are gonna enable this? You know, not talking about AR, VR, but are there any specific technologies now or that are being developed from different manufacturers that are going to take us there? Um, so we've been looking at some things very uh, closely. I had the privilege to uh, look at what Canon was doing with Free Viewpoint at the Rugby World Cup in Japan, which once you have that volumetric capture, that enables you to create exactly that experience where you're not sitting with your mates in front of a flat telly, but you can get onto the pitch. Back then, yep, it looked like a rendered video game and it didn't look like the capture that we used from TV, but that for me is the process there. And today it also takes, I think, around 200 Canon engineers to put that thing in place. So there are some problems with it, but we're getting there. And seeing that, um, I think Intel is making big uh, steps with, uh, with you guys, so um, that is something. But also the visual quality there, I think the moment you're getting a bit closer, which we are, and we are working predominantly in football, so you're far away from the players. The moment, there's a reason why we spent so much money on, on lenses, because you need to get closer to what's happening. If you just have that perspective, it's, for a nerd, it's exciting, but for users at home, I don't think we are there from the technology stack. We see the innovations coming, but I think there's some decent evolution necessary to make it an engaging mass experience. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. And, um, you know, we've established we're in the very early stages of Web 3.0, Metaverse, etc. But what ha needs to happen next um, in our current reality uh, t to push this forward? You know, wearables, etc. that kind of thing. Uh, so um, uh, wearables are, are one. You know, I, I'm not uh, a fan of, um, of VR headsets. I, you know, you just, we, we don't, we use 360 um, cameras, but we have a 360 view that you, you can go around. No one is going to want to sit in a um, headset and watch it. Augmented reality glasses, it's very different. And, and I, I would have brought them if my kids hadn't taken them to school. We, we've launched with, um, uh, with Nreal Air, well, EE, sorry, we're affiliated with EE. Um, at the, we've got the first stage at the moment, which is you put them on and you've got a 200-inch screen. I watched the um, uh, Champions League semis on it. Absolutely amazing. Now, there's one piece that, that is a, a kind of interesting dichotomy is we're saying we need to take out, make these glasses look good. If they don't look good, they won't sell. If they don't sell you've, and you've got no devices, you won't put I won't put investment into creating an experience for them. So what you can actually say is, right, okay, we've got to strip everything out of them. So you're stripping out processing, you're stripping out um, stuff, you, all you want is optics and battery. Mm -hmm. Well, hold on, we've just said we're doing volumetric capture, and, um, and that's so processor intensive 
you know, you, you put them on your head, they, they, they explode. You know, we're talking massive power. So this is where uh, using things like 5G for low latency and fiber, because some of this is going to be in the home, um, you know, a lot of it is. And then you put at the edge of that, you put banks of, um, of GPUs, graphics processing units. And what they do is they'll do all the heavy lifting. And then actually all you're sending is the video stream, head tracking, and that's where the low latency comes in. So I think when we start to see that, mm -hmm. yeah, we've done trials with it, that's where we'll see um, the sweet spot of here we go. And obviously if Apple come out with some AR glasses, we'll all be rushing around <laughs> trying to get something because there'll be loads of them. No, exactly. I mean, yeah, well, uh, I was about to say that. I mean, we, didn't, we need a big tech company like Apple deciding we, we're going to go, go big on this and provoke this mass adoption that we, that we need. But yeah, I mean, it's going to take a, not one technology, but tens of different technologies and a lot of computing power to, to make that happen. It's not going to happen in, by 2023, I don't think so. I think for me, the, the important part is besides those technology innovations is that... Um, as boring as it sounds, standardization. Today, the market of people that are on online platforms, they are very fragmented, mm -hmm. um, which sometimes for marketing purposes is good because you know who, to, who you're targeting when you, go on, uh, when you go on Instagram, you know who you're targeting when you go on TikTok to make justifiable investments if we have a scattered scenario like we have on the social platforms and those applications will be more expensive, it will become very difficult when you say, okay, I need to develop for 15 different uh, metaverses my, my solution and my rights are scattered around 15 different metaverse solutions. I yeah. see a big challenge there. Yeah. We have it with smart TVs today. Smart TV apps are horrible to build because it's so expensive because the market is not suboptimal. So, um, and I'm really concerned that we have a lot of people rushing into the metaverse world and then you don't have a concentrated audience. Mm -hmm. So I think if somebody figures out a clever way to building, building bridges between those that you have theoretically Twitter users talking to Instagram users and them having the same watch party in the same augmented world. You translate that. I think this is really where this can take off. Mm -hmm. and, and final question for you. Um, you know, in the future, how do you think we'll see activity in sports broadcasting, which is mostly within the metaverse side of things, and uh, the Web 3.0 side, which at the moment is something clubs and federations are looking at for NFTs to monetize and entice uh, fans. When, when will we see these crossing over? And how will they cross over? Um, that, that's an interesting um, one that I'll, I'll try and answer because I've been, I've been thinking about it. Because at the moment, it is very much, you know, you've got, um, you know, clubs in NFT, um, you know, NBA have done NBA Top Shots, which is you, you can go in um, and they digitize and, and it's, um, uh, you, you get the shot, if you like. So you get LeBron's dunk and you've got a short thing and you own that and you trade them and you know they, they go up dramatically in in price again it's what's art to someone you know and um so that's very good for the clubs um and broadcasters have a, a lot of art and they have a lot of historical things so you could take a a, a broadcaster's top promo won multiple awards say mm -hmm. but actually how do you how does the market work where you might have footage of football matches or baseball or, or whatever, where do those rights sit for those images? Then you've got players, they have their image rights. How does this all work? I think there's a lot more in terms of um, what we're gonna see. You know, it, it's still the Wild West around the NFT piece and I think we're gonna see a lot more coming out because you know, it's really, it, if you've got a piece of art, you've got a piece of art. And then, you know, someone, someone and the, the analogy is, if you've got an NFT of a um, image, that's where the technology means that you, you can't forge it. You know, you could, yes, you could print it out um, and put it on your wall, but you could take a photo of the Mona Lisa, you don't own yeah. it. Um, so I, I'm, I think, probably didn't answer the question, because there's so many outstanding things as we're so early on. Yeah, yeah. Any other thoughts, guys? 
No, yeah, I mean, uh, there's, there's so many legal hurdles to, uh, to figure out. I mean, because there, there's a lot of gray area, and obviously when you're in, in sports with dealing with rights holders and, and broadcasters, I mean, we, we typically don't like gray area. So, um, so that's going to be an issue to make us early adopters in that new world, is that we, 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 we need to have a proper environment where there are a set of rules and contracts and so on where uh, it, it can work for us. I think that's a very interesting point because when you, I think NBA is super successful what they're doing. If you noticed closely how they changed their description on what you actually own when you buy such an NFT, I think there have been some of those lawyers that came up and say, yeah, you might want to change that phrase because it, it is tapping into broadcasting rights. And there are in those rights, there are exclusivities and those need to be solved. Um, where is, is it going? For me, there is a bit of an, a dystopian aspect to it because while I can own a lot of art today, the marketing company that is having a deal with my football club doesn't know what type of art I know. If that art is mentioned on a public ledger, out of a sudden I know that PSG knows what I have hanging in my bedroom. That's a bit of a scary thought. <laughs> and, but you can, for me. No, no, but, but you can make money with that thought. And so I know there will be people that have... That I'm definitely not the first person who's thinking about that, but that's a bit of a scary one when we speak about information that is publicly available, which is great, but there are some concerns around that. And I think this is exactly where those pieces are coming together. A club will be in a position, rather than offering the match, they can say, I have a community. I know that community to the level of detail that I know what they have hanging in their rooms. Um, and they can offer that, and that will have a different, that will change the rights value, and that will have a different proposition of what clubs, federations can offer to either there's be broadcasters or tech companies in the future or wherever the world is going. Fantastic, excellent, excellent note to end on. Does anybody, before I say goodbye to my brilliant speakers, does anyone have a question for them? Come on, at least one. Sounding silence. That's fine, that's fine. They're probably <laughs> digesting it all. Okay, thank you. Can we have a round of applause? <laughs>